Hello, hi. Welcome to Arvis with Harbo. If I've never met you before, then I hope you are a wonderful person, you're having a great day. If I have met you before and for whatever reason we've stopped talking, hello, I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is me starting a new YouTube channel where I talk a little bit about the books that I'm going through each month. Uh, a bit about myself. I was an English teacher for a little while. I did all of my training and my qualifications and I fell a bit out of love with that profession, but I fell in love very deeply with books. And so, although I wasn't a very good English student in high school, I eventually got to a point where I was, I was reading quite a lot and I was finding a lot of enjoyment in the things that I was reading. And so it was good for me to look back and reflect a bit on each bit of reading that I did every month. And last year I got into this great rhythm where every month I would have a few different categories and I would work through those and really try to deepen the kinds of literature that I was exposing myself to. And I thought I would share that process this year, and I would at least leave a record for myself about how I think I did. And if you would like to follow along and see some books as recommendations, then you are more than welcome to. Thank you for joining in Arvo's with Harvo. My name is Harvey, by the way. I didn't clarify that, so. That's fine, this is fine. I'll fix it in editing. Okay, so a quick introduction to how this challenge works. Uh, I have a few different categories, and what I'm going to do is every month I will try to read one book from each of the categories. And by the end of the year, that means I will have read 12 of the old classics and 12 of the international books, and it will ideally broaden the kinds of literature that I am able to talk about. So the categories that I've chosen to focus on this year are I have seven, so let's hope I can remember them. First one is classic literature, or old classic literature. I thought I would draw the line before 1950, because I feel like every book there before then has a little bit more going on with its context, with its values. It takes a bit of effort to try to understand them, whereas I feel like anything published in 1960s and after, the values can be quite similar to what we have today, so I read them in a very different way to those of the old classics. The next category are the modern classics. This one's a bit more tenuous. I think about anything that's won a recent award, something like a Pulitzer or a Man Booker, any book that people are going to be talking about, uh, those books that are useful to have read and to know a bit about, I would put that in the modern classic category. Next category, I also want to try and read one big book every month. And I've always had a bit of a fear of big books because there's a lot of different reasons why they might not work out. Uh, they're a big time investment. Sometimes you read for a long time, it doesn't turn out very well, or sometimes you read halfway and then you forget how it's going and then it's really hard to get back in. I want to challenge myself to read some of those books that I was never able to finish in the past. So that's big book. I measure that as about any book that's more than 120,000 words. That's about twice the length of your average novel. So something that takes that kind of effort and gives you the opportunity to really stay with the characters and to experience a larger world than you normally would. That's what I want to do with this big book category. Next one, I have Australian literature. I'll try to read something that is quite well known as an Australian author. I, being an Australian myself, don't know a lot about Australian literature, so I would like to explore that more. And maybe this could be the interesting angle if you're watching from somewhere outside of Australia. You get a good introduction to the kinds of authors that are considered known or famous in this part of the woods. Next category, we're going to have genre fiction, because I am not personally a huge fan of fantasy or science fiction, but I've watched a lot of booktube in the last year and a half, a, a lot of booktube. And everyone loves it so much, and I wish that I could have that same experience. So I'm going to try and ease my way into fantasy and sci-fi. I find those two genres quite difficult to get into because there's just a different way of reading. You need to have a certain attentiveness, you need to have a certain propensity for suspension of disbelief. I find that very challenging, and so I find that if I practice that over the course of this year, maybe I'll read some of those classic books that are also just really, really important to the genre and then I'll start to appreciate them. Okay, what else am I missing? Next category is going to be Globetrotter. And what I really want to do this year is read books 
about countries of the world written by authors from that country. So I, I want to try and avoid the westernized lens of uh, a European or a American author writing about a South American or an African country. I want to read literature from that area to try and better understand some of the history and some of the geography of it. Uh, this might be a bit difficult because I don't know a lot of good books that fit on this option yet. I feel like the education that I personally went through was very Eurocentric, right? We read a lot of things from Europe, a lot of things from America, but also I'm trying to be wary of the fact that the novel itself is a very European art form, and lots of cultures don't have written, published storytelling in the same way that England did. And I was trying to think about a few different ways that I can meet this part of the challenge. But I would also very much like to travel through literature and to experience a bunch of different places that I might never have seen, broaden my horizons, and hopefully be, hopefully be a bit more tolerant as well. That's my hope for this category. And the last one is going to be trash. And no insult to any of the books that end up in this category. What I want this category to be is just very popular, easy, cozy, pleasing fiction. Books that don't keep you up at night and don't make you think for hours on end. Books that are just simple and easy and enjoyable, and there's a merit to that. What I really like about reading quote-unquote trash is I can go in there with no expectations, and I can be really, really surprised at what I find in there. So I don't have to worry about thinking about big ideas. I can just be pulled along the story, and I can enjoy the characters and enjoy the dialogue and enjoy a story on the terms of the author, which is something that none of my other categories are going to allow me to do. Okay, so that's my introduction, and let's look at the books that I read for January. I'm gonna do a cool YouTube cut, like... Okay, so these are all the books that I read in January. I read seven, so I successfully did every single category, and I don't know how successful I'm gonna be with the rest of the months of the year, but we're starting strong, so that's good. Let's go through the order that we talked through, which I have already forgotten. I'll also explain how I'll talk about each of these books, because I'm a person that really likes to know a bit about a book before I start reading it. I know that some people can be very touchy about spoilers. I personally don't care that much about spoilers, because if a story is really written well, to me it doesn't have to rely on that surprise factor. It can just communicate the emotions, even if I know it's coming, it's still valuable to me. Uh, I know not a lot of people think that way, so I will try to be as careful as I can about spoilers. I will talk very generally about the book at first. I'll bloop a little warning on the screen and I'll say, okay, I'll talk more in detail, but even then I'll be in broad terms. I won't spoil anything that seems to me like a crucial part of the book's storytelling. So if there is something that needs to be a secret for the book to be enjoyable, I'm not going to talk about that. But I think we do need to talk about how premises function in the book, right? So if something happens halfway through that really changes everything, I would like to know that as a reader. And maybe some of you out there share the same sentiment, in which case it might be useful to keep watching. Or you're totally welcome to skip to the next book too if you don't want spoilers. Yeah, I want to <laughs> cater to every kind of reader here, so whatever goes, I'll leave timestamps everywhere, I'll leave warnings everywhere. I'm very sorry in advance if I do happen to spoil something, but also I'm not that sorry because it doesn't bother me that much. Okay, let's get into the books. Alright, so first book of the month that I read was The Sympathizer by Viet Thanh Nguyen. This won the Pulitzer Prize? Yeah, it's on the cover. Pulitzer Prize in 2016 for American fiction. I knew of this author first because I was teaching a lesson on one of his short stories. It was from the Refugees Collection, and I found it really interesting because it's difficult as an Asian American writer at the moment, especially when you're working with content like the Vietnam War. There's so many assumptions that exist within the American audience about what that war was and what the Vietnamese identity is, and so whenever you're writing from that perspective, I'm sure there's a lot of challenges because you're thinking about how you want to represent that experience. Can you be true to lived experience? And can you avoid some of the pitfalls and avoid people 
misinterpreting your work or thinking the wrong thing about your culture, right? I feel like that would be very personal and very difficult. I quite liked The Refugees, the short story collection, because at every turn I feel like it was trying to not subvert, but it was trying to sidestep a lot of the stereotypes that I feel like we have within Vietnam War storytelling. And that rings very true in this novel as well. So this is quite a long book actually. I took me quite a while to read it. It features a main character who is a sympathizer with the North Vietnamese army. He is a spy that escapes with a troop of soldiers in the South Vietnamese army and goes to America in the middle of the war. Uh, they spend some time in America as migrants, getting used to their environment, but also having the standard trouble that you have when assimilating into a society. Difficulties with language and with food and with culture and relationships with people that in your in your home country you might not have even interacted with. But because of this system of migration, you're forced to create ties with people that you might never have talked to. And that leads to these really nuanced, complicated interactions. I did feel that it was quite a segmented book, and I thought this all the time when I was reading it. It feels like a few short stories stuck together because there are a few scenarios that happen and when they begin you're interested and you're pulled into a very self-enclosed premise and then that scenario ends and we go somewhere else and something else happens. It's very clear when the main character goes to a different country, when he first goes to America and then when he visits the, the Philippines, in each instance it's a different vignette of his life. There's an arc to it. There's some interesting commentary about uh, the migrant experience and about culture and about the Vietnam War, but we move on from it. And so I didn't feel that the main character's arc was very clear-cut or well-developed. It felt like a lot of things that were happening, and this main character was just there for each one incidentally. But I realize it sounds very negative. I did like this book very much. I thought that the stories were well-told, the language was interesting. I really liked the quite dense character connections that we had there because the fact that the protagonist is a spy, there's a lot of tension built on the idea of conflicting identities, who is going to be loyal to, whether it's his friendships or whether it's his political leanings or whether it's to his military general. Every decision that the protagonist makes in this book feels very, very weighty and that's what kept me going, is just seeing how he continued to navigate this really intricate and delicate and precarious situation that he was in. Being an American, being a Vietnamese man, being a person of multiple loyalties, there's just that much richness in this book. Now, I do feel that it approaches a, a lot of really lofty points about what it means to be Vietnamese in America, I can't personally speak to that too honestly because I'm a Chinese person and I'm in Australia, so I would be more interested in reading critique about how this book approaches that topic. I've seen lots of differing reactions on this in reviews, and so the last thing I would want is for anybody to pick this book up and think, oh, this is like the, the definitive representation of the migrant experience, because that doesn't exist, but it is a very valuable book to keep in that pantheon of things, right? If you're interested in that experience of migration, I think that this book here communicates that really well. It's a very worthwhile book. I would have got, I think I gave it four out of five stars. That's a great way to start the year. Okay, second book I read this year was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This one is near and dear to me because in year 12, I was required to write an essay about Frankenstein and the film Blade Runner. And I did not finish that book, so my English teacher, if you're watching this, I am very sorry, but also I make YouTube videos about books now, so who really lost here, right? Um, it's funny because I remembered a bit about this book. I read, I think, two-thirds of it when I was 18, and I remember having a lot of trouble with the language because it was published in, I think, the early 1800s, and maybe back then I thought this book was difficult. It was probably one of the first old books that I tried reading, because I clearly must not have read much else when I was a teenager. Uh, but now, having read lots of 
uh, Renaissance literature, lots of Romantic era literature, lots of Victorian literature. This book seems like one of the easier ones because it is quite short. It does have themes that resonate quite cleanly into the modern day, and also, I think I understand a lot more of the references in this book. So, I know what Mary Shelley is trying to do with every instance. So, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the story already. Victor Frankenstein is the scientist who's very ambitious. He decides to create life through the process of uh, galvanism. So he assembles a bunch of body parts, stitches them together, and brings it to life. And his creation is not what he wanted it to be at all. He ends up having this incredible conflict with his creation because he didn't realize how much responsibility it would take to give life to something. And there's all these interesting questions about morality and science and the right and wrong of all of that. But it's also very much a book about nature. And what I found this time, having been an English teacher for a while, having talked at length about the Romantic era and the Romantic poets, Shelley was very much a figure involved with this pe these people. And what's so interesting is that throughout the book, there's lots of these references to romantic poetry. Sometimes Mary Shelley just drops in a line from a poem that she likes just randomly into the prose and it doesn't even connect to the story. It's like not even a character saying it, it's just there. And the descriptions of the landscape is just so vivid and lush and enjoyable. And I think as a teenager I didn't get why that was happening, but having gone through all of that context and understanding it as a teacher, it's interesting because it's the contrast of individuals and science against this really spiritual view of nature as being ancient and wise and able to heal and change in a better way. I think that conflict is very interesting at the heart of this novel. It leaves it very worthwhile and is it really an easy read if I couldn't finish it at 18 years old? I'm still gonna say yes, it's probably one of the easier 1800s reads. It's another good way to start the year. I need to kind of ease into these difficult books so I get, a, I get a sense of how to extract information out of them. And it's also just very, very nice that I can read a book and not think about how can I fit it into a lesson or what techniques are there in the prose. Just sitting back and enjoying a novel has really let me see this in a new light. So yes, Frankenstein, also a 4 out of 5. Really, really good. Really good time. Okay, so third book I read this year. This one might not be familiar to folks, so I'll move it up. It is the collection of short stories from Elizabeth Harrower titled Few Days in the Country and Other Stories. Elizabeth Harrower is one of the most, I almost want to say most respected novelists in the Australian tradition. She wrote four novels in across the 1960s and 1970s. That was The Watchtower, Down in the City, the Catherine Wheel and The Long Prospect, and I own all four of them and this book, so I am the ultimate Elizabeth Harrower stan. Uh, she is interesting because she is a very psychological author. She often writes about family situations that are marked by control and manipulation and neglect. And that might sound depressing, but it's done very beautifully she has this clear understanding of how human beings think and the duality between their thoughts and their actions. And it just is very, very fascinating to read her work because it's like looking at an intricate diorama of the human mind and getting a sense of what it must be like to be in that situation, but also how people end up in those situations. Why do people become horribly abusive or why do people stay in relationships where they get no benefits and live in fear. Those are the things that really stood out to me about her novels. And this is a book of her short stories. And each one of these stories I wish was a full novel because they are all with the same complexity, or most of them have the same complexity as their novels. They're all about characters and their difficult relationships and there's a really complex psychology to them. But they're, they're short and they end so quickly and they end at around the point where I think, oh, I get what's happening now, I get what kind of relationship this is, but the thing that I enjoy about her novels, The Watchtower in particular, is that you're forced to stew in these situations. And they're terrible and painful and harrowing, but 
you feel it. And in a lot of these stories, I felt that they ended a bit too early. I felt they had a lot of potential, but if I was going to recommend Elizabeth Harrower as an author, I wouldn't select this book of short stories. I would select one of her novels. Most popular would be The Watchtower, uh, but that's probably also out of the ones that I've read the most harrowing. So Down in the City is also quite good. Uh, that's a better sense of her style. And once you get what she's trying to do, then these short stories can be a bit more valuable to you. But otherwise, you might just think they're a bit boring because they're just about people. People having trouble expressing what they want and people finding connections that aren't perfect, but they need to make the most of it. It's interesting. I would have given it a three out of five because there's definitely some really good things about it, but I think it falls quite far from what it could have been. Okay, so the big book for January for me has been The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon. Sorry, I should have checked how to pronounce his name before I did this video. Uh, this is an enormous book, just to clarify, like, look at the size of this versus my Frankenstein. It's like double the size and like double the thing. It's so big, uh, but the, the font size is really big and there's a lot of, there's a lot of wasted space. So. I didn't actually think this book was quite as long as it was because, first of all, it's a thriller, so you read it very, very fast, but also, I don't feel like that much happened in it. Um, the premise is that there is this bookstore slash magical place called the Library of the Cemetery of Forgotten Books, and it houses all these novels that, for whatever reason, have been abandoned to time protagonist comes through and picks out a book that is going to be his and he tasks himself with protecting that book, finding out the history of that book, seeing who the author was, why it ended up being so abandoned and he goes home and he reads the book and he falls absolutely in love with it. Just every single word leaps off the page, captures his imagination, he falls so in love with it. Um, and. It's a big quest narrative on finding out the truth behind this secret book, which is also called The Shadow of the Wind. Now, I didn't like this very much because, and there's various reasons, but nearly all of them involve spoilers. So if you don't want this spoiled, if you do want to read it one day, the main thing I would say is that it is a very compulsive mystery. At the end of every chapter, you get a clear and definitive reason why you must keep reading. And so you are pulled along this novel by a bunch of different plot threads and hidden information that you as the reader want the answer to. That is my full stop here, and then spoilers will begin. I wasn't particularly satisfied with the answer to a lot of these mysteries. The, the main thing that bothered me, and this goes for a lot of whimsical books, is I don't like it when the author sets up the potential for magic and says, oh, this might be a really interesting magical realism genre book. There's a lot of these religious or mythological imagery that occurs in the first 50 or so pages, and you're excited, right? You think, oh, I want to know what's going to happen. And the rest of the book is an exercise in giving a logical, rational, no magic explanation to how everything has happened. And to me, I feel like that robs the book of some of its power because it's like the curtain was, was opened and all that was outside was just the regular world, right? And you wanted there to be something more. You wanted whimsy and you wanted magic and you just get reality cool. Uh, so there's that. But also, this isn't a very old book. This was, this came out in, I want to say 2001, it could be wrong, but it's, it's not old. But the values within it are a little bit archaic. The book is set around the Spanish Civil War, and it's grounded in that historical period. And I, I get that there's a difference in values, but I feel like when creating historical fiction, a modern day author isn't necessarily bound to the specific values of that time. And I have to say this about the book's treatment of both social class and gender. I think that 
it's very beholden to the restrictiveness of the way that people saw social class and gender back in the 1920s, but there were definitely opportunities for the author to subvert that or weave in a little bit of the 21st century understanding into it, and I didn't feel like that happened very much. I felt that very much a lot of the characters in the story had values that I was disappointed with, and there wasn't so much to make me like those characters. I don't know if the if the book was written with the assumption that people would rationalize these characters as acting within their context, because even after doing that, I had a hard time liking a lot of these folks, and I think that made this book hard to enjoy as well. So. That's probably what I'd have to say about this. The last thing too is that I'm not a huge fan of that trope where books are mystical and magical and portals of the world and worth protecting. I think a bad book is just a bad book, right? And if a book ends up in the cemetery of forgotten books, the likelihood of you reading it and going, oh, this is amazing, this is life-changing, I can't believe that it was lost time, I don't think that happens. I think that if you go into a used bookstore and pick out something that has been forgotten to time, chances are it was forgotten for a good reason and it's probably not going to be the best thing that you've ever read and it's doubly difficult for me to enjoy this book because it's a book about the magic of storytelling but I didn't feel the magic of storytelling from this book so it felt a little bit pretentious, a little bit overlong wasn't my favorite read of the month by any margin. I gave it a 2 out of 5, very sorry to the author and I'm very sorry to anyone who really likes this book. Uh, hopefully I rationalized that well, but I'm looking forward to reading more big books. This one is probably an example of why I don't like them, but welcome to be proven wrong. Okay, for world literature this month I read Things Fall Apart by Jinhua Achebe. This one, it's very famous. It's a book that gets taught in high school really, really often. It's the story of uh, an African tribe that encounters Western civilization and the kinds of ramifications that occur out of that. It's a story of a warrior named Okonkwo who is, is very powerful but very flawed. The story works quite strongly in the Greek tragedy tradition where there's a person who is respected in the society and you understand why they are powerful but also there's a fear to them because they have this really this really glaring flaw of their personality. And Okonkwo is definitely that kind of person. He is hardworking, he's powerful, he's earned his position in his society through his efforts alone because it's introduced very early on that his father was not respected in his society. His father was seen as a coward and as idle whereas he set out to be the exact opposite of that. But that has resulted in Nkonkwa becoming this very proud and a little bit arrogant as a person. He's quite dismissive to the people around him. He has a lot of trouble forming relationships and that results in him tragically being uh, exiled from his society because of uh, a really bad accident and so the story follows how he rose up in a society how he left and then the impact of uh, Western settlers particularly missionaries on the culture of this book now I find I found this really interesting because it's written in English uh, the author has mentioned that uh, Igbo the language of the characters in this book is not elegant when written because of various consequences of um, Western influence and so he's decided to use English and it's interesting because it's so it spends a lot of time within the society itself I'm sure when it was first published I think in the 1950s it would have been a lot more dramatic to have a story that was entirely about African characters because to presumably a white audience, it would have been quite difficult to form that sense of attachment and empathy. 
a lot of Western writing about Africa, about South Asia and East Asia, they tend to use a white protagonist because that's their cultural connection, right? Uh, whereas this book just throws the reader straight into it. And it forces us to see the society and to consider it not as an ideal, because there are lots of flaws that the author clearly wants us to see in this original society, but it's stable, and it's complex, and it's regulated, and by dwelling in that kind of environment for a long time, for more than half the book, we then get to see the tremendous impacts that the missionaries have. And it's very tragic. It was quite difficult to read a lot of the time because on one hand you're trying to understand this culture that's being depicted, but on the other hand it's also just depicting lots of really hard emotions and situations that I've never been in before. I'm sure lots of people have never been in that kind of situation before. And so it requires a lot of empathy, but I was, I felt very rewarded having read this because it made me think about culture and society in a way that I haven't done before. And it's really interrogated a lot of the assumptions that I have, uh, not just about Africa, but about the impact of Western civilization on all cultures. Even in my history, looking at Chinese history, the, the way that we view Western influence from the 1800s and even before that, there's a lot of richness there. There's a lot of things that are worth thinking about. And I feel like because of the way the world has developed in the 20th century, a lot of those thoughts haven't been fully articulated. In fact, more likely they have, and I'm just too ignorant to have read it yet. And that's entirely what I wanted to reveal by doing this international reading thing. So this one gets a four out of five. This one is definitely a great introduction to it. I am going to be on the lookout for more world literature. I would love to get something that was translated as well. I find probably this category to be the most difficult that I need to face. So yep, that's that. Also, I need to edit this back in. I really like the use of symbols and metaphor in this book, particularly with food, because every food item, how do I phrase this? All the food in this story has a really interesting symbolic element because of the way that it's grown, prepared, shared. That's so interesting to me because there's all that thought that's gone into it. I love the way that the coconut, coconut, cola nut. I love the way the cola nut uh, is symbolic of sharing because whenever characters get together, they break it open and they they take the time to eat it in each other's company. And I like the way that the yam is the symbol of power because it's sustenance, but it also requires so much labor and so much cooperation with the land to su successfully grow. That was just really interesting to me. And that also explains the, the reference in uh, Kendrick's Quinta Quinte, where he's yelling, what's the yams? I think that's also from Roots. So I need to read more, I need to read more. Okay, next book. This is one's going to have some spicy opinions. The fantasy book that I read in January is Kasuo Shiguro's The Buried Giant. And I know that when this book first dropped, I think almost a decade ago, wow, what am I doing? Uh, when this book first dropped, it created a lot of drama in the sci-fi fantasy community because this author is not really known for working in this genre and much more so back then than now, there was a stigma against writing in fantasy and science fiction because those weren't the genres that were earning the top prizes, they weren't considered literary in the same way that, I guess, realistic books about sad human beings tend to be considered literary. And so Kazuo Shiguro is one of those authors that jumps the gap. He writes realistic and historical fiction like The Artist of the Floating World, The Remains of the Day, but he's also written a speculative fiction book, um, Never Let Me Go, and The Buried Giant, and I believe the more recent Cloud and the Sun are more traditional fantasy stories. They contain fantastical elements. And what's interesting to me is that Kazuo Shiguro, sorry to all his fans out there, 
he seems to write the same book over and over. Which is very weird for me to say because he works in speculative and he works in fantasy and he works in realistic and historical and crime, but he loves the theme of memory. And every one of the books that I've read from him is about memory in some way. This book, the premise is that it's a little bit after Arthurian England. It's in that weird period of the, the English Middle Ages where there's not a lot of history, not a lot of recorded history, but there's also great superstitions. People believe in ghosts and spirits and werewolves and dragons and all of those things, right? And so it's this interesting period of history or mythology that this book is set. And the conceit is that there is this mist uh, covering over all of England, which is giving people amnesia and they're losing their long-term memories. But they are aware that there is this cultural difference between the Britons and the Saxons, and there was previously a war, but no one's really quite clear about that anymore. And it follows these two characters, Axel and Beatrice, who are quite refreshingly old. So often we get fantasy stories about teenagers or about people in their 20s, just young, spry adventurers, and we get this interesting perspective of an el elderly couple they're working their way through their memories and they're having the same kinds of adventures that younger people would, but they're having to struggle with themes that are more relevant to an older audience. I thought this was very interesting. And I thought that the themes of memory come out in this book way, way better than in Artist of the Floating World, which I read recently, and also Never Let Me Go. I think that the aim the author has to complicate the ideas of memory and to make the reader ask a lot of questions about whether memory is a good or a bad thing, and how our memory affects the way we perceive the world around us. I think that this book achieves that so, so well. The last chapter just... Ugh. You know those books where you finish reading the last chapter, and you just want to sit there and think about it for an hour? Just There's so much to think about this book. So, yeah, I really like it. It's a great book to read with somebody because it's good to discuss what you think at the end. It's a bit open-ended. There's also just a nice fantasy plot quest structure to keep you interested if you're into that. Uh, it's not the best fantasy story, but it is a great Ishiguro novel. So I think I... Let's get 5 out of 5. I think I get a 4 out of 5. 4.5 out of 5. I don't give halves. 4 out of 5. 4 out of 5. Okay. Last one for the month. This is my trash for the month. Again, very sorry if you like this book. I'm very sorry I'm calling it trash. It's just part of the category, uh, but it doesn't fit anywhere else. This is High Fidelity by Nick Hornby. It's a, a romance novel. It's a breakup novel. It's from the 90s, about the 90s, and it's comedic. It's ironic. It's very, very scathingly satirical. Um, I had a bit of a hard time reading it because the values from then to now, specifically about relationships between men and women, have changed so much and the main character can be a bit abrasive, uh, but overall I thought it was quite enjoyable. So the premise of this book is that the protagonist, Rob, uh, is terrible. He is an awful, awful person. He doesn't have a whole lot to offer in a relationship and he really agonizes about his own flaws in a very neurotic way. So the book opens with him describing every breakup he's been through and how all of them reveal his personal inadequacies and how he has trouble talking to women and forming good relationships and how women are only interested in one thing and blah 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 blah. It, like, <laughs> reading the first chapters of this book, it, I've never read a book where the first two chapters made me want to put it down forever. I was reading this on the beach actually, I went, to, I went to the beach and I started reading this and by the end of the second chapter I was just ready to throw it into the ocean, like I was so disappointed in this first person voice, this awful person. Uh, I think it was written specifically in a time when if someone was broken up with, you have a natural sympathy towards them because they've gone through that difficult experience, right? Uh, and so maybe that's what the book starts with is to develop that sympathy but i didn't have that at all 
Uh, so I was just thinking, wow, this guy's awful. And I was curious as to how this story would develop, because I'm sure the author knows that he also created a character that people aren't going to like very much. So something needs to happen, right? And I thought of two things that could have worked, which is either the protagonist works through their personality flaws, and they do that hard labor of recognizing what's wrong with themselves and improving themselves and eventually getting to a point where they are a good human being, or this person gets just the absolute consequences of what it means to be someone who is so dismissive to other human beings. And I'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. The interesting thing too is that he owns a record store and it's in that weird dip between when records were just the way you listen to music and when records were like a cool retro thing you did. This is around the time when nobody was buying records. People were buying CDs and cassette tapes, but the vinyl was really going out of business. And so his store isn't doing very well. He has two co-workers, one named Barry and one named Richard. He calls him Dick. And together, they are just the, the snark crew, right? Like they make fun of their customers for their bad taste in music. It's really weird because none of them seem to actually like music that much. They, they talk about what's cool and what's good and they, they have this running joke where they ask each other the top fives and say, what's your top five breakup songs? What's your top five um, rock songs, right? And they have to rank them, but this is only for the purpose of making fun of each other. Like, people would bag each other out and say, oh, I can't believe that's in your top five. How have you not put that in your top five? They don't like music for anything other than the cultural influence of music. So if you like a certain thing, you're cooler than someone who likes more popular music, right? And so that's the protagonist we're dealing with. Terrible person. <laughs> so hard to live in his mind. But he is quite sardonic. He does get me laughing every now and then. I very rarely agreed with his views, but he was consistent. And so he narrates the the weeks and months following his breakup, how he tries to get over his long-term life partner and what happens from there. Now, spoiler section. Does the protagonist either work through their difficulties or suffer consequences for their behavior? No and no. I don't think that... Well, the book is hopeful. So the protagonist does have a nice ending. Um, he gets out of his breakup fuzz, things get better for him, and he is a better person by the end. But I wouldn't say much of it is done by him. He doesn't have to do that difficult process of self-analysis. He doesn't have to think about what qualities of himself make him a, a loving or a distant person. He's kind of just taught this by the people around him. And props to the people around him. There are a lot of really great supporting characters that make this book a joy to read, but he himself, I feel like, is a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, and I don't know if that's part of the... part of the contextual difference, or just part of what this author was trying to do. I also had a really hard time figuring out whether or not the author seems to like the protagonist, because I would have thought no, but... Protagonist gets a really big pass in the entire novel. He really doesn't get a lot of consequence. I don't know. I don't know. But did I enjoy it? Yeah. 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 Uh, for what it is, and it is very fitting that I put it in my trash category, it has some laughs, it has some drama, it gets you think about relationships, you don't have to like the whole thing, but there's a lot of redeeming features about it. I think I gave this also a 3 out of 10. So yeah. I would never have read this if it wasn't for this category. And so if this is your favorite book, if you love this book, I'm very sorry. Uh, that's just what I think about it. I said some nice things, right? Okay, so those were all the books for January. Let me know if there's any books that you want to see me put on my list for the rest of the year. Uh, in February, so I know it's a shorter month, but I did finish my January books a bit earlier, so I figured I would take on Crime and Punishment, which I think is like the biggest book that I've ever attempted. I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, I probably shouldn't have put this in the video because it means that if I make my February video and I haven't read Crime and Punishment for my big book, it means that I've failed and everyone knows that. But, oh well. 
guess this is how it is. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. If you feel so inclined, feel free to like or subscribe. Well, you don't have to, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but thank you for joining me. If you have any opinions about any of these books, please do let me know in the comments as well. Let me know if you have any recommendations. Thank you for your time again. This has been Officer Cobber, and goodbye.